Okay, good morning, good day, welcome. Nice to be here with you. I can't see all of you. Can you hear me? Yes? yes. Okay, good. Uh, so welcome everyone for our, our virtual Career Futures event with some really incredible alumni. Thank you so much for being here, Janine, Natalie, and Peter. Uh, I'd like to, my name is Amanda Wojcik and I am a professor of sculpture at the University of Oregon and also the current head of the department and uh, happy to welcome you. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Oregon is located on Kalapuya Ilihi, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the Coast Reservation in Western Oregon. Today, Kalapuya descendants are primarily citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and the Confederated Tribes of Silets Indians, and they continue to make important contributions to their communities, to the U of O, to the state of Oregon, and to the world. With today's event, we express our respect to these people and the many more who have ancestral connections to this land and other displaced indigenous people who call Oregon home. So I wanna let everyone know that this is being recorded and I have a series of questions that I'll begin with. And, and the first question will be to have our panelists introduce themselves. And uh, then after some time, we'd love for you to ask all of the questions that are on your mind and things that you'd like to know from people who have been in your shoes, not quite in this exact way, <laughs> living through this, but um, other points of their life. So let's begin. So the first question, uh, could you please briefly introduce yourself by telling us when you attended UO, what your primary areas of concentration were, where you currently reside and what you do now. Now, I don't know what order we're on in the screen, so I'll just call on Janine to go first. <laughs> I see, I don't know what can everybody can see. <laughs> um, hello, thank you so much for inviting me. I feel really honored to be here. Uh, my name is Janine Nagy, and right now I am the uh, gallery director, and I'm also a professor of art at Los Angeles Valley College, which is in North Hollywood. I was at the U of O from 2001 to 2004, where I technically studied ceramics, but kindly got adopted by sculpture and did a lot of installation work. And yeah, prior to that, I moved to Portland for a while and did a bunch of stuff there. And now I'm in SoCal. Thank you. Natalie. Welcome, Sad, everybody. Thank you, Amanda, for that awesome land acknowledgement. Uh, I really appreciate that. That means a lot in establishing like how we start our meetings and like how we're connected to place and land. So I, my name is Natalie, Natalie Ball. I am currently on my own tribal homelands in Southern Oregon, uh, the Klamath tribes. And I graduated from the University of Oregon in 2005 with my um, uh, double major in art and ethnic studies. Um, and currently I am home. I just attained my MFA and now I'm back home on my homelands and like my studio practices just over there in the back of my house. And I'm raising kids and my oldest is actually attending the University of Oregon um, and she's graduating in June. Um, uh, yeah, thank you for having me, Subkesha. Thank you. Peter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Amanda. I'm super happy to be here. Um, my name is Peter Happel Christian. I was at the U of O in the graduate program, 2001, 2003. Um, and my main concentration area was photography. Although, you know, I'll talk about this later. One of the best parts was that I could kind of, I didn't use a camera. I don't think most of the time I was there in photography, which is amazing. Testament to the program. Um, right now I'm in central Minnesota, about an hour northwest of Minneapolis where I live in St. Cloud and I also teach at St. Cloud State. I'm a professor in integrated media. I'm currently running the art gallery in the art department right now. Super, thank you. The next question is, can you briefly describe your work? What do you make? What ideas are you engaging and where do people typically encounter it? 
we just go in the same order? Sure. Yes. Okay. <laughs> There's no guessing. <laughs> um, well, I when my family and people who don't know me ask me what I make, I tell them that I make black squares and grid paintings because that's the easiest way for them to get a visual picture of what I do. But um, I'm very interested in um, low tech materials and um, material transformations. I work pretty extensively with graphite and with paper, and um, I'm really drawn to these very, like the most basic art materials and to see how I can kind of exploit their physical properties to um, have people have another understanding about what they are and just, you know, what the world is made out of. And um, recently I've been making paper out of fallen palm fronds, um, so just, walking around my neighborhood and picking up all the fronds that fall down because it's like, it's almost like a, a kind of litter that happens here where there's like all this like extreme biomass that, you know, like when they're up in the sky and breezing on the trees, they're lovely, but then when they fall down, they're this big nuisance and I, I always feel bad for them. So um, I try to give them a new life by making paper out of them. So that's been kind of a big push the past couple of years. Thank you. Uh, so I recently I'm making um, sculpture work, like assemblage objects that I like to talk about them as like power objects. And um, I'm just taking found, made, bought, given, borrowed objects and then creating a third space with them um, to create like a new set of meaning meanings. Um, uh, to push really a narrative that really complicates um, the way that indigenous people are seen, um, especially in the art world, in the media, um, just to complicate that history and to provide like a, a more, a meatier way of seeing uh, indigenous experiences through my own um, experiences and histories. Uh, and where can you see it? You can see them, I'm showing next month at, um, where am I? Uh, Berlin and at the Wintrop Gallery, I'm showing a new body of work. It's about Dear Woman. Um, it's titled Dear Woman Gets Enrolled uh, October 30th, 2013. Um, it's thinking about blood politics in Indian country and my own experiences with being um, enrolled by blood quantum into my federally recognized tribe um, and the complexities of that, the oppression of that. Um, and just having a conversation with that. Um, and also my work is at the Rubel Museum in Florida. So there's a, they have a few pieces in a room there of um, textile work. So I also do like larger 2D um, textile work. Um, Thank you. I, 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 um, I make, you know, home base for me as an artist is photography. Um, and so, uh, but I, I make a lot of different things. Um, so I like to tell people that I'm a photographer that makes sculpture and installation and a lot of artist books. Um, so oftentimes I'll, I'll make the things that I photograph or um, in the last couple of years have just shown the things that I make rather than photographing them, but there's the objects are still photographic to me in, in some way. Um, so at least from a materials and process standpoint, that's kind of where I'm coming from as a maker. Uh, the primary subject matter of my work for a long time has been time and landscape um, and all the complexities wrapped up in that um, and what that means, especially in North America and the United States in particular. Um, where you can see my work, um, I've made a lot of books in the last few years. So, in, you know, within the spine of a, um, in the, on the printed page, um, artist books primarily um, has have been really um, fruitful for me. So. Um, you know, I participated in the, the virtual version of the New York Art Book Fair this past spring. Um, and I have a new book coming out called Same Sum through Conveyor Editions, which is based in um, Jersey City. So that's what's been making sense to me a lot. Um, the, the sort of availability of a book um, it makes a lot of sense these days. So, Moving back in time, thinking back to when you were a student at UO, can you tell us about one or two things that were of particular value or significantly influential to you while studying here? 
Well, I just want to um, first start by kind of echoing what Peter had mentioned was that the um, the freedom to explore different mediums and to work with different faculty from other departments, I think was definitely one of the uh, most important parts of the program to me. And that's also something that I can have continued to kind of use as a selling point to when I'm talking to, to my students about UVO and, and the value of going there. Um, I don't know if you guys still do what was called grad review back in the day, but um, we do. That, that's uh, that was like that. Those two aspects, I think, are probably one of the greatest kind of selling points of the MFA program in particular. Um, it was always such like it was always such like a fearful and exciting event, and it was just so like even though it was really like hard and stressful, it was always very like celebratory and like some of the best kind of feedback came out of that and. That was always something that I looked forward to, and I participated every every time that we did it. Um, one of the most memorable things that had happened to me was actually my first year, my first semester, uh, in my first like grad seminar with uh, Justin Novak, and it was like you know the end of September or whatever it was, and the first thing that he showed us was the planes crashing into the towers. This is the first graduate class I'm taking ever. And he was talking to us about the aesthetic power of the image and the po poetic beauty of it. And it was like, I was just like, wow, what did I sign up for? Like, what is going on here? And it was something that has just like always stuck with me so specifically and kind of amazingly. And now like looking back, it's like, just like that quick moment of being like, the world is all around you. And like, everything is material and it was very interesting, powerful, awesome moment, so. Twenty years ago. Twenty years ago. <laughs> wow, <laughs> amazing, that's amazing. It's really 20 years ago, yeah. Thank you. Yes, your turn, I think you're, okay. yeah. 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 Yeah, so the most valuable, I think I should preface it with just saying I was 21, had had just had a baby. She was, well, she was two by then. Um, and I was working full time in Portland. I had never like, a college education wasn't like on my trajectory to where I saw myself. I was just working, being a mama. Um, and it also wasn't expected of me. Uh, so my cousin called me and said, hey, they're offering scholarships at the University of Oregon. She was also a single mama. Uh, her name is Angie Morrill. She's now a doctor. Um, she got her PhD after she um, graduated from the University of Oregon. But her and I, as single mamas, we just applied to the University of Oregon because of the scholarship. It was a full ride. They paid for housing. They helped with um, childcare. Um, and since then, we've done some really dope things um, because of U of O offering us the full ride scholarship. Um, I feel like that was of extreme value for me because it helped me um, sort of like pursue a career, an academic career really. Um, and also I feel like ethnic studies was huge for me because I know like all the things I was experiencing in my life as a indigenous woman who's black and Indian, um, and coming from the communities that I come from, both rural and urban, I feel like I didn't have a language to be able to talk about those things that were important to me. So ethnic studies was huge. It was huge in how I navigated um, the art department and, and how I spoke about my work and it helped me build my language um, around my work even now. Even now I'm pulling from old papers that I did in ethnic studies at the University of Oregon to talk about my work now. Um, so I feel like scholarship um, and ethnic studies was huge for me. It was, um, it just started, it was just the beginning of everything for me and my children. Um, I, there's, you know, a lot of things are memorable for me being at the University of Oregon. Um, I arrived in Eugene from Iowa. So I grew up, um, you know, super landlocked and that, so, in addition to the university itself, um, being being on the West Coast um, and seeing the Pacific Ocean and being close to that um, and to a mountain landscape was was huge for me. Um, 
but then similarly, you know, to um, something I said earlier, Janine um, mentioned um, the ability to to work in a way that that made sense. Um, you know, I I moved. It was the first time I had been anywhere where I was. I had no one there like with me except my significant other at the time. I was like days away from anyone that I knew, and so I was really out, kind of on my own, and that was memorable um, in a lot of ways. So. Yeah, the tons of like intellectual support um, to, you know, kind of figure some things out and the university was like and faculty were exceptionally supportive, like in many ways. So following graduation, the point many of our students are at right now and they have the dreaded question, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Nobody knows what they're going to do. But, um, how, how did you navigate the, the first steps after graduation and um, pursuing a career? What was that path um, post-graduation? Um, well, for me, I wasn't entirely sure what all was gonna happen um, in the sense of, I feel like a lot of times people go to graduate school like to teach art and that wasn't necessarily why I had gone and just because I didn't necessarily see myself as an like in my I didn't see myself growing up to be an educator um not for any reason just because it just wasn't kind of in my sight and when I was at the UVO I also got a degree in um nonprofit management and so another like amazing opportunity at the UVO um because like I I went I wanted to go to school because I wanted my work to get better and then you know i got this other degree because I wasn't kind of sure where I would fit in. Um, but immediately following um, my, finishing my MFA, my husband actually got into his undergrad at the University of Oregon, I'm sorry, at um, or Oregon College of Art and Craft. And that's kind of what brought us up to Portland. So that was just a situation of like, okay, I'm like, I didn't go somewhere for a job. I went somewhere, you know, for this other reason. So then I was thinking like, the only thing that I need to do is to find a job so that I can still make work. So I was like, am I going back to food service? Like, am I going to be a barista? What's it going to be? And coincidentally, and luckily, in terms of timing and everything, there was an opportunity at the Pacific Northwest College of Art for um, really what's like a shop tech, but they were calling in artists and residents, but you would like, it was a shop tech position, basically, and it paid like $10 an hour or something crazy, but it gave me a studio in an academic environment. So that was like, that That probably just like that one thing is like what opened so much up for me because I was still able to like be in a community of, you know, peers and still also be like around other faculty to learn from and make some money. And then it was like from working there that I met someone who um, offered me this class at Clark College. And that was like everything else just kind of like unfolded from there. So. I think just kind of being open to experience, but also just doing whatever you have to do to make it so you can still make the work is just something that I try to tell people who are just beginning. I always forget the rotation. I'm <laughs> <laughs> uh, just going clockwise on my screen. <laughs> so let's see. So after graduation, I, um, I came back home to Chiloquin to my homelands and I worked for my tribe um, part time and, and I was building a, a painting portfolio to enter into an MFA, um, but I really wanted to focus on like indigenous contemporary arts and I found one in Aotearoa in New Zealand. So in 20, 2006, like a year after, a year almost today after I graduated from the University of Oregon, I went to New Zealand with my oldest child and we went and I got my master's in uh, multi visual arts, but I specialized in um, indigenous like contemporary art. Um, and then I came home to have like to build my family and to have babies and um, really focused on our homelands, our language, started a language journey, um, really focused on first foods and food sovereignty. Um, but also with like having more kids. Um, resources got extremely limited and I was working full time and I wasn't able to uh, pursue like a studio practice that was really sustainable. I didn't have the tools. I didn't know uh, what to do. Um, 
I didn't know what to do. So I left my family. <laughs> so I left my family and I went to Yale because I figured that I could get the skills, the um, audience that I needed to be able to pursue a sustainable studio practice. That was my hope. I didn't know. It was all, it was all, I was betting on myself really. Um, and I did that and I came home and now I have a sustainable practice, but um, that's been my sort of like path after the University of Oregon because I, I realized like how valuable um, education is. Um, and also um, it kind of imp imp empowered me to, to know that um, I'm also valuable and what I have to say is valuable. So I um, took that and went to Yale and I was just like, hey, what do you guys have for me? What can we do here? Um, and I came home and now that's, and now I have a viable studio practice, which I'm extremely uh, grateful for. But that's what I did after graduating from the University of Oregon, but it wasn't like a set path. It wasn't, it was all really trial and error. Um, Amanda, can we swear on this? I know it's been recorded. <laughs> oh, I, I like, don't know. All right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Maybe I know, they'll bleep I, it out. <laughs> okay. Well, it's not a big word, you know, but I clearly remember thinking, oh shit, like what am I going to do now? <laughs> I, was, I was so focused on being in graduate school and making stuff. And like, I just, I wanted to make things. I wanted to be in a, that kind of intellectual community that I clearly remember kind of that spring of the last quarter. I was like, yeah, I gotta, you know, I'm not like, I'm gonna be out of here. I got, what am I gonna do? You know, like I was just so like, so into it. And um, my partner at the time, now my wife um, had applied to graduate schools um, and she ended up entering the University of Arizona. So we, I moved to Tucson. And um, so I kind of knew I was going somewhere, you know, and, um, you know, I had it in my mind that I'll, keep making work and I'll try to show it there. Um, I was interested in teaching. Um, I taught a little bit as a grad student and really enjoyed it. Uh, my mom taught at a community college for almost 30 years. So I kind of had it in my mind that that is a profession as a viable kind of way to be in the world. And um, I applied for any adjuncting job in within an hour of Tucson. And I got one at Central Arizona <laughs> college in Winkleman it's an hour commute one way to the <laughs> deep into the desert and I did that um twice a week I taught art appreciation art 101 to amazing students um non-traditional students you know some of the students are older than me um twice as old as me in some cases and I loved it and then I worked at an import furniture store and made art and slowly the longer I was in Tucson um it just turned out that um adjuncting positions opened up at the U of A and at the community college there. And that's, um, that's, you know, that's kind of a very brief snapshot of, I would say the, the three years after um, leaving the U of O, um, I, I was in Tucson and absolutely loved it, but it was, it was tough, but um, yeah, that, that was my trajectory at least right away. I, th I think it's interesting hearing what you both said is like, just like believing in yourself and like trusting in the process a little bit. And Kind of understanding that um like the creative lifestyle looks so different for everybody but um it continuing to invest in yourself i think is really important and like it's sounding like these are things that you know we're all kind of that we've all been like thinking about and you know hopefully continues to pay off but yeah i forgot that you were in tucson yeah 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 it's great So what advice would you give to our current students who are earning their degree in art in a university like UO? Are there things that you wish you would have done or done more of? Well, advice that I would give um, people is be nice and meet your deadlines, which seems like a no brainer. But as somebody now who works with a lot of artists, you would be surprised when this doesn't happen. <laughs> it's critical. If there's nothing else you do, just be nice to people <laughs> and meet your deadlines. Um, something that I wish that I did more of, and this is also something that I tell like people who are just starting out as well, is like um, 
I feel like when I was in graduate school, we didn't have a very strongly connected cohort in the sense of like, after like, like our cohort, I felt, felt like was strong when we were in school, but then after it just sort of like kind of really quickly dispersed and like a lot of people stopped making art and, you know, just like different kinds of things happen that if you can kind of keep your community close to you early on, I think that's, I, I wish that I had had more of that, honestly, just because, you know, you're all going to kind of, there's going to be trials, you know, that and hard stuff. And the more that you can kind of like build your network and work together and, and help each other out too. That's something that I, I would definitely advise young people too, is like, just if you share an opportunity with somebody, that's not going to give you less of a chance of getting an opportunity and things come around. And that's been something that, you know, for me, like I've almost kind of like built my whole career on that in a way of like, like I, you know, had this small gallery in Portland and, you know, tried to help artists out. And like, that got me like the current gallery representation that I have now, like, because I was working with these artists and trying to help these other artists out, like that put me on, you know, Jane Beebe's radar, who's, you know, been my dealer now for 15 years or something like that. So it's, it, it'll come around. So help each other out. Yeah, let me think. Um, so I didn't find art really until I, my last year at the University of Oregon, like my fourth year. So I just really like piled it on. Um, so I hadn't been building like a, a cohort of fellow artists at all. My like my community was ethnic studies, but I was using um, art as a tool, as an apparatus to be able to communicate what I was doing in ethnic studies. So I was really invested in ethnic studies, but using art to couple to to deeper communicate what I was doing. Um, and I think the best advice that I received my last year at Yale was in the studio with William T. Williams. And he was like, okay, you got a lot of kids. Um, you're going home to them. And if you want to make the work um, and stay home in the studio and make the work, apply for, um, uh, fellowships, scholarships, grants that'll keep you in the studio so you're not um, totally dependent on the sales in the galleries so that you can um, really keep the integrity of your work in the studio and I can stay home with my children while I'm making the work. Um, so I, I think that if you're pursuing a career as an artist, um, I feel like getting the support um, from like larger foundations is really important and ideal because it also like um, gives you another audience that you might not have access to. Um, I don't know if you have a lot of kids or not, but um, I'm sure every, every one of us would like to spend more time in the studio. And so that's how I was able to maintain a studio practice um, while pushing the work is just really tapping into um, foundations, scholarships, um, awards and grants, really local and, and national. Yeah, um, I'm going to echo a lot of what's been said. Um, one thing you just said, Natalie, in particular, like small grants. I know, um, like oftentimes students, you know, hear about or learn of the big time ones, big money ones, um, highly competitive, or maybe don't have like a body of work that's ready or whatever. But um, I know for me, um, applying for small grants were early on and getting some were super helpful because it gave me that boost of confidence. I'm like, I, you know, I'm working these kind of, I think of them as like sort of whatever jobs, you know, like right out of school. And, but that like um, acknowledgement of an idea I have in the form of support with funding, you know, $500 or something like was huge at the time. You know, it really felt like, all right, maybe I can really do this. Um, one thing I would <clears throat> suggest is um, something not to do is not to take out too many student loans. Um, because as a graduate student, I had assistantships and things like that. But um, I also, you know, had to take out, do financial aid. I was a first time borrower, you know, and, um, and I learned within a couple of years of leaving, I was like, Ooh, really like that. That's, that's, you know, a lot to sort of wrap your head around. And also I think um, a lot of us who are in the realm of art making aren't so inclined towards like math and like bookkeeping. It's a skill you acquire over time out of necessity. So that's something, you know, sort of nuts and bolts stuff, but I would be like, and now my wife's an accountant of all things. So like, 
I'm learning through osmosis, you know, as it goes, like, just got to keep your, your finances in check or whatever, like make work with, if you've got $10 this week for materials, figure it out. Lots of secondhand stores, you know, just like dig around, make stuff. And that, that'll become ideas in your work because those materials will kind of talk about certain things. So, so I would, that's some advice, you know, just kind of try to keep an eye on those finances if you can. I agree. Um, that's been huge. I just don't talk about it because it's like so stressful. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> taxes, like LLC. Um, I've had to like figure out, I've had to get a lawyer. I've had to get an accountant and a bookkeeper and a wealth advisor. Um, but also like accessing as, as an indigenous woman, um, artist, sorry, as an indigenous artist, really is just finding out what is out there, services mm -hmm. that are strictly for me. And then I've, I've, I'm able to access, it's called ONAC, O-N-A-C, Oregon Native, I can't remember the acronym, but they're, they're a dynamic, small, like group of people who are there to give wraparound services to um, small, like small business owners uh, in the indigenous community, both rural and urban. So I was able, I've been, I'm just really grateful for that because I would be, um, I wouldn't be where I am right now without their help with, with those kind of things. Cause I don't do numbers at all. I barely measure anything. Um, so <laughs> yeah, good. it's really helpful finding like, <laughs> what support you can, asking questions too. Cause at graduate school, like no one talked about this. There was no classes for me about what to do when you get out and you're selling work mm -hmm. or you're, um, you have a, some sort of income. So ask, ask for help too. I would, I ask all the time still, yeah. even now. Yeah. Um, one, just as you were talking, Natalie, something else popped in my mind that's related, like, and to something Janine was talking about, like, I know personally, um, a couple of years out of school, like Janine had this gallery in Portland tilt and I ended up showing there. And when I was in Tucson and that was huge for me, I think I had moved from Tucson. I was in Ohio, um, yeah. but that, that was major, you know, like, so lean, you know, lean towards the, you know, your peers right now, like, um, and that, that is your community, your sort of adopted community and look out for each other, right? Learn from one another, ask each other questions like, hey, I sold something or I want to sell, it. like, I don't, do I need to like claim that on taxes? You know, like ask, ask your people, like you can start there, like what Natalie's saying about ask questions, like, Ask everyone around you because chances are like nine out of ten people have the same question. They maybe haven't hasn't occurred to them yet. But yeah. I liked also in your tilt show and how you were just talking about like maybe not having a lot of money for supplies and you know doing doing what you gotta do to like make your work happen. And yeah, when we when we did your show and we went to a PNCA and you just like swept the floor to get all the dust for the, for the yeah. dust yeah. <laughs> so your, your material is just the dirt of yeah. PNCA. <laughs> Yeah, dirt, art school dirt to make cyanotypes with. Yeah, I mean, it's an idea. It was that's beautiful. Also it was beautiful. We all loved the dust. <laughs> the best part is we've all got it, right? Everyone got it you can work with it. So I feel like this is, is kind of, um, we've already touched on this last question I have, but if there are other, other pieces of advice, what is the most important piece of professional advice you would give to art students who are on the cusp of graduation? I think you're talking about some of these really important things, but anything else you would say? Oh man, right away, make just make stuff. Like maybe re recalibrate the scale of what you wanna do or how long it takes to do something. But I would say like, keep, keep making things, you know, and you feel like kind of lost, you lose facilities or community, like look at the last stuff you made and what you love about that, like use that as a way to step forward. I, I think it's, I mean, if you're not, you just gotta keep making things, you know, um, and let yourself be surprised by what you make. I think that's you personally. Yeah, and, and take yourself seriously and take, yeah. your, take, your, take your work seriously because if you don't, nobody else will. Uh, what's well, been extremely integral for my um, practice is building a language around your work. Um, 
Um, so it helps um, steer the conversation around your work and it helps people to like um, be able to access your work in a certain way. Um, I think a lot of the times um, my work was getting filtered through these like projections, projections of Indian that were extremely problematic. So I just felt like um, developing a language around your work is extremely important. Um, and that'll help you um, realize what you're actually doing in the studio is like having that language and like thinking through language about your work that's really like um, objects and sculpture or well, for my practice specifically, but um, language has really been a huge tool in communicating my work about my work and helping me just to understand what I'm actually doing um, in the studio. Cause a lot of the time the work goes first and then the language comes second. Um, so I think language is important. I would definitely agree with that. And for me, that's actually been a place where, I, where I've asked for help a lot um, because I don't feel like I'm a strong writer and um, sometimes I do have, I don't know, I don't, I don't know that I would necessarily say that I have like an intuitive way of working, but the work definitely does like get ahead of my thinking about it a lot. And if I'm in that workspace, then I just want to kind of like follow that and, and honor that. And so very, a lot of times, sometimes it'll be like three months before I have to kind of like step back and reflect and then it's like a different part of my brain in a way. And so like, I have these like fragmented thoughts and ideas, and then it's been just really helpful for me to like sit down with somebody who like, maybe their craft is writing and, you know, have them ask me questions and have me, you know, like to kind of like talk it out a little bit and then, you know, get, get help from somebody who does have that more as a skill has been very valuable for me. So. Janine, how, like in that instance, how did you connect with say that, that writer, that person who, you know, uses first, those materials? The first time I ever did it was actually through Tilt and it was um, Chaz Bowie, who I think still works in Portland, but now might be like a, a real estate agent or something. But at the time he was a writer and he he was a critical writer and wrote for maybe Willamette Week or something. And he would review shows at Tilt and we kind of got to know each other that way. And um, it had gotten to the point where I was like applying for grants and just feeling like the, like, I felt like the, the work was strong, but the language wasn't. And um, I just kind of asked him as a friend and he helped me out and um, like, and then since then I've like actually, you know, hired people to help me out with that. And um, I don't know if that's like a faux pas to say, but it's like, it's something that I'm not good at that I know I need to be better at and working with other people has actually helped, helped me be better at it myself. So, you know, don't be ashamed about things that you don't know how to do. And, you know, it's, it's all part of it. Yeah. Um, there are some questions in the Q&A that I will read and please feel free to anyone add any other questions. Uh, so to everyone, are there any grants or scholarships you particularly recommend or that have helped you the most? Thank you, Natalie, for already mentioning one. The Oregon Arts Commission has um, a small well, I don't, it's maybe big now, but it was smaller back in the time that was specifically for um, um, professional development, like professional practices. And I don't remember exactly what it was called. Maybe one of you guys know, but um, that was actually one of the first grants that I had ever gotten. And I had gotten it a couple of times and it was, and it was for, you know, like if you had like, you, if you were never having a solo show before and you had that opportunity, but you needed money, it was, you know, for something like that. So it was a grant that was specifically for building your practice. That's one that I would very highly recommend. Are you talking about the career opportunity grants? Yes. yes. Yeah, those That's are exactly terrific. Those are really awesome. terrific. And now I think they're big, right? It's like $7,500 or like a lot of they money. They can be. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would say that one for sure. Mm -hmm. And I know that for that one there, like in particular, always looking for um, like first time uh, grant applicants for that particular grant. Yeah, I would, I would say um, at least, you know, here in the um, state of Minnesota, Minnesota is a really robust public arts funding kind of structure and by region. So I'm in the central Minnesota arts board region and they have different layers of um, grants, but then they have student focused ones like a student scholarship one in particular. Um, and then the, so I'm, I'm advocating for like a regional, maybe geographic grant, and at least in the model that I'm familiar with, and that 
um, in central Minnesota, the pool is small, like versus like the, the metropolitan regional grant, which includes Minneapolis and St. Paul, which is just a, uh, it's a, a larger, you know, pool of applicants. So your odds are lower um, than if, you know, it's a smaller regional grant, but it's, you know, the same amount of money generally. Um, so I can't speak specifically, you know, kind of locally about what's available, you know, in the Eugene area or Lane County, but just looking towards those maybe smaller regional arts organizations that sometimes, you know, are able to, to fund things that are project based, but then it connects to like having the, having the language, you know, like that's been brought up, like the language around the work, being able, like, if you're not a good writer, like maybe you have a, a buddy that, you know, is a good writer who's not an art major or whatever. <clears throat> and you connect dots with them, like buy them some lunch, like, hey, we read this thing, make sure I'm not insane. Yeah, like, exactly. Make sure I'm know, not insane. That, <laughs> that's, that's what it sometimes, it was for me. Like I oh. gave my early writings to someone and she was like, are you okay? Because this is barely <laughs> comprehensible. Like I knew, I knew my work, but I did not have the language for it at all. I needed help, you know? Yeah. I got a whole list of scholarships, everything. I've got a running Excel spreadsheet. Like I'm about um, the money bags because that's how I've really learned how to sustain my practice. Um, just with like the times of COVID, the social unrest, like what's happening in my communities, it's really scary. And a lot of the times I've had to like pause shows um, because of what I'm dealing with at home, health, everything is happening right now. So I just been really fortunate to have the support of like institutional backing. Um, so I, I would love to give like a class or something to where I can say like, this is what I've done. This is how I've navigated um, funding my practice. Um, there's a, there's some really great ones. The Joan Mitchell I got recently, that's a, a larger one. It's like a national, it's on a national scale. Um, the local, the Ford, um, Bonnie Bronson, that's, you have to be nominated for that, but that's also about doing the work, developing your language. And so people will have you in mind and nominate you. Um, uh, there's a, there's really a lot, there's really a lot. And then having a language around your work is, is like imperative to applying to these things. Um, like the Pollock Krasner I got, language is really important because I had to frame my research. Um, yeah, I would, I would love to share what I have. It's just, a, it's a lot, but um, I would Google it and ask your, um, if you're associated with galleries, ask them um, about the money bags because they're out there, they're out there and people want to fund the arts. You just have to be, um, due you have to do your due diligence and you have to, um, it's like you have to set out time for that to be able to write and to apply and to really crisp in your applications because it's like, it's tough competition out there, but it's worth it. It's totally worth it. And it feels good to get the congratulations letter. Yeah. <laughs> One out of every million. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, and, that's, and that's the thing too, right? Like gotta keep applying. Yes. Because no matter, yeah. no matter where you're at in your career, I feel like there's always gonna be rejections, you know? like. I, you know, I live and work in yeah. the LA area and there's a lot of really famous artists here and they, all of them, they always talk about getting rejected from stuff, you know, like that's a thing. So get that, you know, get tough now. Get mm -hmm. that thick skin ready. Yeah. <laughs> the nose. Failure is like, I, yeah, it's just going to make you better. Like if you fail at something, then just keep at it and you're just going to, I know it's cliche, like failure is great. Yeah. Like we all have to do it. It hurts, it sucks, but it, it's it ultimately made me better. It's just made me better. Um, yeah. And humble. It keeps me humble too. Like, I mean, living on a reservation also keeps you humble. Yeah. <laughs> but like, um, yeah, failure is important to my practice too. Um, uh, yeah. And something I, that Peter had mentioned, like, applying for like smaller re regional grants, a lot of times those organizations will actually offer you feedback on your grant if you don't get it. Yeah. Definitely yeah. take them up on that offer because that is a very, very kind offer. And that is uh, a service that they're providing to emerging artists. So don't feel like, oh, they didn't take me. So blah, like, yeah. 
be like give me more tell me tell me stuff yeah get critique me like yeah. critique is huge in my practice too I yeah. think that comes from Yale because they had like a whole um pit crit where you got you got creamed for like an hour <laughs> but um no it's been really good for my practice um uh, but also I wanted to say that for indigenous artists um locally the NACF um they just got the Yale Union building in Portland and they're, they're going through some great changes um, and transitioning towards smaller grants that are specific towards different art forms so I would definitely get on their newsletter um for the NACF um, this this is reminding me of something that I remember specifically while at U of O um, in grad seminar um, when it was the time I took it, Laura Vandenberg got it. I distinctly remember her saying, expect to get one into like one acceptance out of every 10 that maybe you toss out into the world. And I know in my mind, I just did the math. And I was like, well, that means I have to apply to 10 things, to, <laughs> you know, to, to have that return rate. So I'm like, yeah, you just have, you got to put it out there, right? Yeah. Otherwise you'll never get, you'll never get one if you don't try. I mean, it sounds so cliche, but it's true. Like it's just not going to happen unless you're like pumping it out, you know, and applying. Put it in the mail. It's not the yeah. mail anymore. <laughs> it was the mail when we were, <laughs> when we were starting, we had, yeah, packages. That's a, that's a stamp. <laughs> Remember those packages? <laughs> uh, so how did you all first get your work shown? What was that process? There's always that goal of, I want to have a show. How, how did you do that? That is a, always a great question. Um, I feel like for me, it was a little weird because I had kind of, ended graduate school by making these like large installation projects, which are probably like one of the worst ways to <laughs> start your career as an artist because they're expensive and temporary and, you know, they're obviously very problematic. But um, that was also kind of the reason why we had opened this gallery called Tilt was to specifically do like project-based works or, you know, give home to things that wouldn't necessarily have a home otherwise. Because Portland was very, very different back then. There was like nothing compared to like there were no yeah. artists on spaces really like there was a very small handful it was like not a thing um so that was the main reason why we had started doing that and then like from there like I said that's how I met Jane Beebe who has PDX Contemporary Art and she offered me to do like the window project so that, that was like an early on thing and then Peter kindly invited me to do a large installation um, project at, in Youngstown, Ohio, which was mm -hmm. where he was teaching at the time. And again, that was like favorite connection at Tilt. And then things just started to sort of unfold a little bit from there. I um, invited Chris Moss to my studio and he invited me to do an installation project at Linfield College. And that was kind of like the one that was like the major, like that particular piece, like still to this day, was probably like the most significant in my career even even though like it's so long ago and I don't really make that work anymore at all that was the one that was like from there then I got like a solo museum show so like they just kind of all started to like build but but again it just kind of goes back to like trusting in your practice and, and and making the work that's true to you at the time and not feeling like you have to be like on trend or you know like I knew that I would never be able to like get gallery representation with that kind of work but I was able to go to like weird places in the midwest and work with different students and i would you know have the opportunity to work with otherwise so so really like the first kind of 10 years of my career was kind of really kind of based in these like academic galleries where i would be invited by people to come and do an installation and then work with students and that just kind of kept building for a long time Um, I think you talked about Portland, how Portland is a lot different than what it was. And I, I agree with that. I feel like the work that I was making while I was in Portland um, just didn't, wasn't be, really being supported. I wasn't supported as an artist there. I was getting, I had a lot of confrontations and like um, things that happened that were really unfortunate. And, but I feel like it's Portland's different now, but because of that sort of, um, rejection as the artist that I was and what I was talking about um, in these spaces that are that are big spaces for artists 
um, and to be rejected from them in a certain way just pushed me towards Yale. I just was like, man, let me just broaden my audience. I feel like maybe this isn't the conversation for my hometown. Um, but now I'm back and I'm getting support in Portland, but I think that it's because um, a lot of the people in the institutions are gone. Um, and and my practice has changed as well. Um, maybe the art just wasn't good, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I just feel like um, for me, it's about being really specific about where the work is shown. Um, I, I, I don't take everything or anything, even like when I was coming up, um, I think that's really important because it just like, what kind of conversation are you gonna have around your work is important for me um, and who my audience is. Um, so I'm really interested in spaces, not specifically for indigenous artists. I feel like our work deserves to be seen in all the spaces. Um, so that's why I'm really toward of, sort of like curating where my work is seen. That's um, not saying that I don't, like I still, I, I still, um, I'm still in these spaces, but it's on my own terms all the time. And I get to talk about what I want to talk about. Um, Cause a lot of times in these spaces, um, your conversations get censored, uh, which is unfortunate. But um, yeah, I, I just um, am picky. I'm picky about where the work is shown. And I feel like your work deserves that you don't have to take everything and you don't have to say yes to everything you'll get there if you are really invested in your studio practice I think you'll you'll get there I think that's I totally agree with that I think people should be selective with where they show for sure mm -hmm. I agree and I agree it's, it's really important to to I don't know again lean lean on your community of people you know, like your peers, you know, that you've met in the program, maybe, I mean, are some of, some of them are going to like evolve to want to, you know, maybe run a space more than make stuff, you know, and they, that, that could be a, a way, you know, to like test out, you know, like a test run for everybody. Someone who's interested in like having a space or running it or programming, you know, at a space, um, and it, there's like trust built in to that relationship, you know, um, I think that's a, a good move as well. And, and get your own stuff cooking too. And, you know, again, like with, with three friends or five friends, like convert somebody's garage into a gallery space and, you know, do, do a show or a couple, but, but take it seriously and treat it like it's a gallery and, you know, promote it like it's a gallery and, you know, but the, like I said, if you take yourself seriously, other people will too. And there's, that's, I think, a great thing about being an emerging artist right now is that there are so, people are so open in terms of where they'll go to, to look at art and, you know, what they'll, what they'll support. And it's for, for sure in Portland, but I feel like, you know, even in LA and, you know, Atlanta, like all these other places that, that I've, you know, worked as an artist in as well, it's like the, the emerging art scene is like the artist run spaces are kind of like driving a lot of what is going on. Yeah. Um, what was I gonna say? <laughs> yeah, I, I agree too. And also I feel like the landscape of how we're showing work is changing just because yeah. of like everything that's happening in the world, but Art Fizz, it just came out, it premiered. Art Fizz is pretty cool. You can curate. I would suggest looking into them and like curating. Well, you some people have the opportunity to curate their own shows through ArtFizz, which is pretty cool. Um, I think it's ArtFizz.com. They're relatively new. I did a um, a sign campaign that donated money towards um, uh, BLM uh, movement and issues, and so I, they're pretty cool. I would look into them. I don't know another place like ArtFizz. Um, and I'm relatively new to them too, but I look forward to working with them in like the future. Uh, I have another question from a guest to everyone. How do you manage or channel or overcome the anxieties that come with this current time, the pandemic, social injustices, et cetera? How do you, and, and how do you deal with imposter syndrome if that's something you experience? <laughs> Those are two really different things, maybe related. Uh, <laughs> I have I have two children. Um, they're 
nine and 12, I guess that's the first thing that pops into my mind. Like uh, my studio is at home. Um, they've been at home a ton. They're kind of back in school a little bit. Um, and in respects to like um, Black Lives Matter and BLM, I'm a white guy. I live an hour from Minneapolis. And probably the most important work I'm doing right now is educating my son on how to, how to be good people in the world. Um, and so as far as like managing a pandemic, um, ongoing, you know, institutional structured racism, like I feel like my primary job is to make sure these, these little white dudes coming up, you know, are, are solid, like moving forward. So that's kind of step square one for me, like to be perfectly honest. Um, you know, I can kind of, uh, you know, I have a teaching job that, you know, has a certain level of security. Um, and um, I'm super thankful for that. And that's been really helpful for um, me personally to like wade, wade through the last year. But um, yeah, really think, thinking about um, the world as it is, how it got that way, and how I can affect change through raising children differently and making sure they're, they're good people. Um, that's, that's kind of what I'm doing these days, like art making's right in step with all of that. But at the end of the day, that's really what I've been focused on. That's how I've been kind of, I can't remember how the, the question like phrased, you know, these like all the components, but, but that's, that's been the number one thing is like focusing on like how to make sure that young people that are living through this, um, do a better job. Nice. I take CBD. <laughs> <laughs> no, for my anxiety, it's it's like um, it's it's legal and it's and it's great. Um, but also just thinking about like the communities that I'm in that are extremely violent and have a history of this violence. Like right now, my tribe is fighting um, for water rights. Um, we have like sovereign water rights, but it's like not being upheld. Um, the ranchers are currently stealing our water for their cattle and their alfalfa. But then the result of that is our lake is dying. Um, and also that our fish relatives, our trom and our koptu are um, threatened to be extinct really soon because of that. It's like one of the biggest water wars in, in the United States uh, right now. So I just feel like um, knowing how to protect ourselves, um, just myself as a woman and a, and a mother, who is an artist and who is um, in these in these spaces that are extremely violent is really important to know how to protect yourself. Um, and also just self-care, uh, just being really kind to myself is really important um, and being kind to myself in the studio. And also, I think you talked about deadlines earlier. It's just like, I often, I'm the nice artist, but I often don't make my deadlines. Um, <laughs> So it's just really being transparent with uh, the, the galleries and the curators and the institutions about just what you're dealing with um, that, is a, that is affecting your ability to meet these timelines. And, um, and writing that into your contracts as well is really important. I've had to work with my lawyer on writing, building a language around that to allow for that time for me to like um, be able to be an artist during these times. Um, but actually getting legal help to make that possible. And so people have to respect my time and my boundaries and to know what I'm dealing with um, in my communities and, um, and, and my home and the studio. I love that all this is happening and there's like <laughs> filter in there just grouping. <laughs> and Illustration. And now... <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. On cue. <laughs> Um, this year, the big, like one of the big things that I've been working on this year is um, it, as my role as the gallery director, and this is also something I didn't talk about that much, but I like from leaving um, grad school, like I, I've always had these, like we had this gallery called Tilt that, you know, we talked about, and then I was the first curator in residence at the Shakta. So like I've always, like I've been in these kind of curatorial type roles before, but I never, I don't ever really have the title of that. I don't have ownership over that title. Like I think of, I think more about like, um, like I'm a facilitator of things. And I think that's mostly because I'm not necessarily like involved in like 
the scholarship around art necessarily in terms of the presentation. So this year with still having a gallery on as part of an academic institution, I've just tried to really kind of think about like really what the responsibility of my role is and like what, what I'm really trying to do in our gallery and to like be really kind of like hyper-focused on our um, audience, which is, you know, our, it's a community college in Los Angeles. We have one of the, um, it's the most diverse in all of California and like second in all of the country. So we have all these, you know, this wonderful range of voices and experiences. And, um, you know, for like the first four years I was there, it was just kind of like in this really regular mode of like, now here's a new solo show by this artist and here's this next solo show by this artist. And even though like there was, you know, diversity in subject matter and artists, it was still just like this very kind of like stale way of thinking about art and being a part of art. So since being online, we've only just done um, projects for students or projects for, for our community. And um, we've just invited artists who want to um, work with people who might not necessarily have any kind of art experience at all. And um, my kind of mission, and I think that, you know, even when we go back to campus, is just to have people feel like the gallery is a place for them. And even if they have never made art before or they've never seen art before, it's still for everybody. And I wanna, um, you know, put programs out that, that encourage that and that welcome people. and have people feel confident, you know, trying these things and um, yeah, so. So this is a very practical question. How did you price your work when you first left college or how does pricing work? Because this is so other for artists. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> It's a tricky one. Something talking. <laughs> um, you know, a friend of mine just said, um, you know, whatever price you start at sets a precedent. So don't don't price too low in the beginning, because then you know you can only kind of it only can go up. So, um, and that I think that relates to the ideas that, that have been mentioned about self care and like being kind to yourself and like paying yourself, right? Like I think. Um, that's um, one of the one of the hardest things for artists um, to really wrap their head around is you know like you're creating a budget for a project or or trying to price work is like you got to write in like you know how to pay yourself right so pay yourself accordingly I mean you know have a contingency and a budget and like um, figure out like how much how much do you want to make for what you do you know like what seems fair what seems appropriate. Um, but I think it's important to, to start at a, a level that, you know, respects um, your time, energy, and labor and effort um, in doing what you're doing. I know that's a very abstract question, and maybe <laughs> the questioner wants something more concrete, but um, that, that's how I would begin. And if it's in a, you know, kind of see what prices are, you know, similarly, I suppose, in the space that you're approaching or um, if you know, it's a, a group show, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to be the artist that has like, you know, it's priced 10 times more than everyone else or 10 times less, you know, I mean, that's, they, I don't know, that's, that's it, from my perspective, there's no formula. It's always been sort of a tricky thing to manage, personally. Yeah, pricing is deep. It goes deep. Um, I think that I had sort of like lowballed myself. I, I just um, signed a contract for a commission for the University of Oregon in the in a new building. And just having that conversation with um, the people I was dealing with um, helped because they're like, hey, we think that it's like, you want to raise your price up a little bit? And just having that conversation because I'd never done a commission before um, on this scale. Um, so just talking it out and like really being honest about like, my pricing and like asking them for input has been really beneficial to me, but also like sales in the gallery is a lot different. Um, but like you said, like not going too low, but not going too high because you're thinking about the, the, the long run. Um, that's really important. Um, 
uh, there's a lot that goes into pricing and I, yeah, that's a huge conversation, but I'm glad that people, that we're talking about it now, but I feel like that, that would take time. We would need another, it would be specific to another just focused panel, I think just on pricing, um, but also wage. Wage was huge for me when I got out of um, school. It's the, what's that website? Let me Google it real quick. Uh, working artist in the greater economy. It's an acronym wage, it's a nonprofit. Um, you, I think you can access it, hold on, son. wage of work, um dot com is that it that's a i think that's a great resource that's a great suggestion because yeah. they have all these like scales of like where you're at in your career and also you know like uh performing arts and visual arts and it's a good that's a great resource i think also when you're first starting out um i mean that's another great thing that you can ask for help on i think um also, you know, typically if it's gonna be a commercial gallery, like in my experience at least, they're gonna pretty much tell you what they think. And they're gonna ask you if you agree, like, but they're gonna say like, this is our audience and this is, you know, what we know about you as an artist and this is what we think that we can sell your work at. Um, and that's always been like super helpful for me. But um, the one thing that I would say is like, you don't wanna to go too high too fast because it's, you can't go back down and, um, like, and for me that like, there's a, always been like a little bit of weirdness in that for me because my one gallery is in Portland and then my other gallery is in LA and they always want to put stuff higher for prices down here because they, you know, cause it's just, there's just more collecting and stuff. So I always have to be thoughtful with like what goes where and what goes where first. And um, so you don't want to go too high too fast. I would, I would add, oh, go ahead, go ahead oh. Natalie. Uh, I was. <laughs> you go. <laughs> I was just gonna say. I was just gonna say that, like, you have to keep in mind that they're the galleries are taking fifty percent of your sales. Like you, it's a yeah. constant yeah. negotiation. It's a yeah. constant, constant negotiation. Never let them just price it. Make sure that they check in with you before yeah. they price point your work, um, and that you're on top of that conversation. Because because I don't have gallery representation, I'm like. I work with a few galleries, but like that's been my, how I've navigated is like just to, how do I navigate it without representation? So it's just, it's a lot of work though, um, but you have to always be on top of that conversation. Um, and even ahead of that conversation, you have to sort of like demand that conversation to happen on your time. Um, so they know what's up. Cause I think that pricing is really important and it can hurt your career, like how yeah. you price your, how you price your work you yeah. have to be on top of it thinking about auctions houses and just there's a huge it's not just pricing it's a part of the larger conversation of art and um even the history of it uh, and where we are right now so i think it's it's an important conversation but i would just say keep on top of it and drive your own sales and uh, don't price too high <laughs> i would say what i was going to say my experience of being um hosting tables to like art book fairs, New York art book fair, Chicago art book fair. There's a, there's a real kind of crisp threshold for pricing of art, um, artist books, edition books, um, art photo books. And I'd say that that threshold is about $35 a book. <laughs> like if, if it's above 35, it starts to get, you know, like, woo, you know, if it's 50, like that's, that's from a big time publisher hardcover. You know, so some, you know, printed matter and things like that, it seems like 30, 25 to 30 is a real sweet spot. That's where things, in my experience, at those book fairs, the New York Art Book Fair at Moment PS1 is gigantic when it was in person, you know, 30,000 plus people in three days or whatever, and things will move there real fast um, if they're priced in a certain way. If they're priced high, you're going to have a whole bunch of stock to ship back home, you know, that you don't want coming home. So at least like in, in that sort of narrowness, right? This is maybe more to like to a big long conversation, but in the in the sort of art book world that I've been a part of, like 35, 30 to 35 seems to be a sweet spot. So do you think that there is a big difference in the professional world between a BFA and getting a BFA and MFA? versus a BS, BA, MS, MA? I, 
I personally do not think so. Um, saying that just from my own experience in both like working in the nonprofit sector as well as in academia. Um, I feel like it's really about the work. Like if you, and, and you know, I've seen, I've worked with many artists who don't have any degree in art at, at all. Um, and I feel like now there's plenty of, you know, grants and opportunities that, that are, that don't limit that or, you know, that's just my experience. I, I would say, yeah, that I agree with Janine. I mean, um, in some ways, like the BFA is a credential that looks, looks a certain way on your transcript, you know, but it really just comes down to um, the nature of the work, you know, what you're after, the conversations you wanna have. Um, I mean, I know if I'm not mistaken, the BFA program at U of O is a, a fifth year singular. It's is four it now? now. Yeah, it's we four just now. changed okay. it four a couple now. years oh, ago. Yeah, bad. so I, I know they're structured differently. So like some BFA programs really feel differently, right, than, in, than another program. But um, um, I would say, you know, a BFA maybe lets you dive deeper um, than a a BA program, but that's just, again, that's just like a thing on paper, in my opinion, like, it's, it's, I don't, I don't really, I personally don't see how it matters. It's really about the person that's doing the, doing the stuff, making the work. It, and the, at the Cal States and the University of California, just the UCs, they, there's not, there isn't a BFA. So that's like a whole, those are two gigantic state school systems that just don't even offer it. Hmm. Uh, so how do you manage? Oh, go ahead. No, no, just we can we can keep it pushing. It's fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, new question. How do you manage the right level of sacrifice in your life or your work? <laughs> that's like I, I have no children and I have very few friends, so I don't know if that's <laughs> the right level of sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> how that worked it out. <laughs> But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> My studio is at home, you know, um, in the basement. I have one one little window, you know, dreams of, of different space um, at some point, like I think a lot of people probably do. But um, uh, for me, it's it's been hugely valuable to have my workspace at home, especially when our children were really, really young. I could literally pop in here for 30 minutes drop in, sort out something that was, you know, tracking through my mind and then go make dinner or whatever. And it's been like really productive and I can, I can kind of seamlessly move, you know, from one headspace to the next. And, and the nature of my work is kind of reflects the sort of day-to-day -day world of, of my own life. And so like stuff that happens in the course of any day in my household becomes my subject matter in some ways. I use my garage as the extension of my studio when the it's not minus 20 or whatever and <laughs> so I mean there's sacrifices in that my workspace is always home but I also see that um most days good days is like a luxury that you know I can just pop in I see my sacrifice is like time away from home time away from kids it's like I see that as like a really huge compromise or sacrifice in my sacrifice in my practice so I agree like having my studio in my home is is has been extremely beneficial but also a lot of my materials come from the other parts of my home so it's they're all related and they're all um I'm, I'm having to sacrifice from the studio to raise kids from the kids to, to, to the studio so it's just I guess a balance uh, but they inform each other so I, I just feel like um, I need both of them to make the work that I'm making so uh, they're good. The kids, like, they might not see me um, for days because I'm in the studio, but I'm just in the other room, you know? I mean, I'm still cooking. I'm still, I'm still doing things, but I also got them dogs. They also have dogs now to, like, take some of that time um, away from me. And, um, but we're also homeschooling. So it's just, it's just a weird time uh, to be making art, but a really important time to be making the art. So I just say, it is a sacrifice, but it's like, it's worth it, I guess. Um, I see it in, in the positive rather than the negative. 
That, that reminds me, I, I have a clear memory of being in Tucson one year out of grad school and the tail end of like a, a bender of television, like <laughs> six, the show Six Feet Under. I mean, this is a long time ago, so DVD rentals, right? And I remember thinking like, oh, it's a good show. And then I was frustrated that I hadn't, I'd made a dark room in a shed in our backyard. And like, I remember thinking, and I haven't been out in the dark room. I haven't been in the studio for a few days because I've been watching the show constantly. <laughs> and I was really frustrated with that choice I had made. And I was like, you know, there's like thousands of people in my same situation, fresh out of school, who aren't on a six feet under bender. And I was just like, I got to, I got to dial this in a little differently, you know, if I'm going to, going to try to have a real go at this. Benders are good, but you know, I had a moment where I was like, that's choice. I'm making choices, right? Like, but that was a long, that was, you know, pre-pandemic. Now, like all bets are off. It seems like some somewhere. I like, I like that you both talked about home studios because I also have a home studio and this is my first time ever. And, um, this I don't think is necessarily the case now, but a, a while ago, you know, when I just got out of graduate school, it was sort of like, um, like it was like nobody wanted a home studio. It was like, you know, it was like a weird thing or, or you know, people would be like, oh, I just wouldn't be able to concentrate in a home studio or this and the other. So, so there was like this whole big thing of like getting a studio right away and getting like the best studio that you can get. And again, in Portland, it was different because there was a lot of studios, you know, available where now there's very few, but, um, I think that, you know, just goes down to like, how can you, how, again, like, how can you make it so you can still make the work? And um, I think home studios are awesome. And it's, it's going to be about discipline, no matter where your studio is. And, you know, I think that people who come to do studio visits and, you know, curators and collectors and all sorts of people, are, they're used to seeing like all sorts of different kinds of things. And, you know, I've, I've been to people's studios where it's like a corner in a room. It's not even a whole room. And it's like this table here is my studio. And that doesn't belittle the work at all. It's just, it's actually more like I'm excited that somebody is, is carving that space out of their time and out of their life to, to still, you know, commit to their practice. So whatever works. Um, as an artist graduating in a different field, I don't really have a close community of artists around me. Do you have any advice on how or where to find artist communities, especially in Oregon? People don't always talk about like going to things, you know, like go to openings and say hello and introduce yourself. Um, so hopefully that can start happening again in the next year or so um that that is yeah i don't i don't that would be kind of my number one way is you know get get involved with things and go to things and say hello to people i agree getting involved being making yourself available to help um uh, like the MRG Foundation in Portland, they have the Lila Jewel um, Scholarship. Um, that's a great one. I was able mm -hmm. to sit on their, um, what is it? The panel thing where you decide who gets the award. <laughs> um, the the like jury. Just making, yeah, I was the jury. I just <laughs> making yourself available and like wanting to have, wanting to connect, I think is really important. Um, and show up because a lot of them have like, um, like for me, like the NAYA, the Native American Youth Association, I think it's called. Um, they have art uh, and they have like galas and like I think connecting to community also connects you to art. Um, so I would, I would consider that. I would also say volunteer um, or, in, you know, find, it, find an internship or a volunteer opportunity at a arts organization. There's, you know, tons in Portland and now it seems like there's stuff in Eugene too, so. Yeah, I really like what Janine said earlier also about making something, making your community. And I feel like our students, a lot of our students have done exactly that and yeah. graduated and together with their friends started something that can start really small and then can become a really central yeah. hub for contemporary art. And so, especially in Eugene, which is not yeah. Portland, yeah. there are not maybe the same kinds of um, 
events that you would frequent uh, and that happen very often even. So um, I think taking yourself seriously is very good advice with your, with, with your friends, doing the things that you like to do and then doing that really well and seriously. It's been a great path for a lot of our graduates. So someone came a little bit late and says, um, sorry if this has been asked before I came. Uh, what do you think? And maybe we'll just kind of, this could be our last question, just kind of parting words also for the, the students who are, are finishing up their term the next five weeks, it's all happening. Uh, what do you think the most valuable skills you brought away from your college experience uh, besides, develop, besides developing a portfolio were as an artist? What were your skills? What do you tell? <laughs> I think being able to take hard feedback and and use it so not necessarily thinking that like everything that somebody tells you is is the word but to really be thoughtful with what makes sense for you and you know what can you take and what can you leave I think I I mean I think I learn time management. It's kind of weird to say that, but like in retrospect, I think I really figured out how to like, um, you know, sequence my day or my week and, you know, prioritize things that matter to me um, and respect my studio practice and, you know, or income and things like that with part-time jobs. And just like, I think it, it helped me sort out how to, how to na navigate that, you know, but it was all about Prior prioritization of kind of what I wanted to be doing. Yeah, I think I, I agree. I agree with that um, prioritizing. So I got my MFA. I got really serious about art when I was at Yale getting my MFA and they teach you how to be extremely prolific in the studio. Um, and that's like good or bad. Like, yeah, that's in conversation with like capitalism and always like producing and like making, but also that helped me to figure out what was important in my studio practice. And it helped me get to a place where I, I could meet deadlines when I was behind, you know, it, it made me um, more efficient in the studio. Um, so I just think that was like a huge skill that I learned while being in an in, in MFA program was just being extremely pro prolific in the studio and learning how to, um, to make to make no matter what you were dealing with, because I, it's easy to get just bogged down with life, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, so what at Yale, so what <laughs> you had to make the work. Um, so I learned that whether that's good or bad. Um, it's just been, it's helped me in the studio, especially during now, during this time where we're dealing with so many other things rather than just a deadline for an exhibition. So, um, I appreciated that. Thank you. And uh, this is probably a good time to, to wrap up and thank you all for all of this time. And it's been so wonderful to see your faces. And uh, just so you know, Natalie is also giving a visiting artist lecture here at UO in a couple of weeks. So it's May, um, um, I think May 20th. 20th. Okay, yeah. May yeah. 20th, good. So that'll be virtual and you can all tune in and um, I know some people will be having studio visits um, with you as well. And uh, this is terrific. Thanks, alumni. I love alumni. <laughs> it's, it's so wonderful. And uh, I wish we could see all the faces that were listening to this. Who knows if there's anyone there? No. Who <laughs> 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 could just be enjoying? Yeah. Uh, and there is uh, just another quick announcement. There are some um, drop in quote unquote, ask me anything sessions today with alumni, some of you and some other alumni who are working artists starting at 3.30. Um, so there's a link in the chat for Peter and for Lily Lee, who's another uh, former student. And um, thank you. I see, okay, this chat. Um, yes, we're, this is thinking you. I think you can see this chat too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, yes. <laughs>
Well, thank you. All right. Yeah. So thank you, Amanda. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for everybody who came. Yeah. It was yeah, really fun. Stay, yeah. stay safe. Have a good Friday. Yeah, yeah you too. You Take too. care. Take care, everyone. Bye. Now it's happening. Do we just leave? I think, I I think so, right? Yeah. Thank you. Bye.